All right, everybody, thank you for joining us um, for our monthly Lunch and Learn series. We're going to get started. It's noon. Um, this month, we are going to be discussing what to expect at Family Court. Uh, so just a little housekeeping, first of all. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, everybody is on mute for the duration of the webinar. If you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat feature. Um, I will try to address any questions for my portion in the beginning, and then Sarah will be monitoring um, and address them at the end. So again, thank you for joining us. So just an overview today, we're going to have a little discussion on what is kinship care and what are kinship care services in New York State, uh, as well as what the navigator provides for services. And then I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Hedden, the supervising attorney at the Center for Elder Law and Justice to have a discussion on what to expect at family court. My name is Ray Glazer. If you don't know me already, I'm the director of the New York State Kinship Navigator Program. We provide information, referral, and education services for kinship caregivers all across New York State. Just a brief overview of what our Lunch and Learn series are. Really what we're trying to do is provide presentations for professionals all across the field that work with kinship caregivers to learn about specific issues that you might be seeing um, with caregivers. Uh, so far to date, we've talked about food insecurity with hunger solutions, uh, social workers for kinship benefits with NASW, school administrators and educational issues with council superintendents and fostering our future with AFFCNY. Um, we'll send out a recording of today's presentation after the presentation, as well as the PowerPoint, and you can access any of these videos on our YouTube channel. Next month, we're gonna be discussing the New York State Kin Care Coalition, as well as legislative initiatives for kinship care in New York State. So first of all, what is kinship care? Kinship care refers to non-parents, usually grandparents, other relatives, and non-relatives known as fictive kin, who provide full-time care and control of children in their homes. Um, most kin that we see are maternal grandparents, uh, it's over 50%, and we like to say that we see kin uh, children come into kinship care because of basic kinship math. Usually what we see is maternal grandma taking care of children because something happened to her daughter. Um, one plus one equals two. There's two parents in a household. Usually what we're seeing is that for one reason or another, one parent's not involved. Uh, usually it's dad. Mom can't take care of her kids, so her mom steps in to care for the children. I always want to make note that that's not always the case. Um, we see aunts, uncles, adult siblings, and as I said, fictive kin, but usually what we're seeing are maternal grandparents. And why do children end up in kinship care? Well, usually it's for the same reason that we see them come into stranger foster care. Um, there's something happening in the home. It's either an abuse, neglect, parental substance abuse, mental health, death, incarceration, military deployment. Um, these are the same reasons why kids would end up in foster care with strangers, and as you can see, they're not great reasons. Um, so kids do tend to come into care with a lot of trauma. They have high ACE scores, averse childhood experiences, um, and caregivers are taking on quite a bit of responsibility, um, not only taking a child into their home without a lot of notice, but also taking in traumatized children. It is worth noting that kids that are put into kinship care tend to do better. They have higher placement, they have higher stability, they're in a comfortable situation, a familiar situation with loved ones. So the kinship system of care across New York State really is geared toward providing the best support, information, education, and referrals for these kinship children. So a common caregiving concerns that we do see across the state have to do with financial stability, um, kids aren't cheap. Caregivers do need some assistance raising children. Uh, school enrollment, what are my rights? How do I enroll these children into school and make sure that they get the education that they need? And especially in the past year uh, with COVID, how do I support them in a hybrid or remote environment? And then also legal permanency. Um, that's really what we're gonna focus on today. Uh, what are my rights as a caregiver? What are my legal options? How do I navigate the system? 
So the New York State Kinship Navigator, we are information referral education and advocacy for caregivers all across the state. Um, we have a helpline where we take intakes for caregivers and work with professionals to assist them with the caregivers that they're helping 10 to 4 Monday through Friday. Um, we're available by phone, email, or we have an online chat feature. Um, we do have a website, www.nysnavigator.org. We've got legal fact sheets on different kinship issues when it comes to applying for financial assistance, different types of legal permanency options, such as custody, guardianship, school enrollment, dealing with child welfare, obtaining official documents. Uh, at last count, we have over 60 cited legal fact sheets, which means they cite law, but they are also written in a very straightforward manner so that professionals and caregivers can understand them. We have online videos for caregivers and for professionals on how to fill out applications for grants, short primer videos on what is the financial assistance for caregivers, legal options for caregivers, what is kin gap, we're always adding to our library. We're able to come out and do statewide presentations either in person via Zoom. Uh, we provide legislation education on what kinship initiatives are and assistance with kinship budget from year to year. We do provide case-by-case -case advocacy for caregivers as well as statewide advocacy. And then we have um, something called virtual case management and virtual support groups for caregivers, as well as referrals to boots on the ground services across the state. So our strategies really are to connect caregivers to available financial assistance and legal advocacy. We partner with the 14 funded OCFS kinship programs that provide case management to informal kinship families across the state, permanency resource centers that serve post-guardianship, post-adoptive families, departments of social services, and we host a centralized information database for caregivers across the state. Information on our helpline and our website for you. We do also provide a service called virtual case assistance. This is part of a federal grant that we are working to evaluate Kinship Navigator Program uh, as part of the Families First Act. Right now we have a case manager that covers Warren, Washington, Saratoga, Rensselaer, Fulton, Otsego, Orange, Saratoga, and Montgomery counties. Um, she provides case management for caregivers that is virtual, so not on site, but also is more in depth than our information education and referral program. Um, so caregivers are assigned to a virtual case assistant. She's actually on our webinar right now, Kari. She's fantastic. She works with them for at least six months. Um, she assists them with uh, benefit applications, referrals, working boots on the ground with um, service providers across the county, making sure caregivers know how to navigate family court, um, can access tangible resources. She works with any service provider that they are currently working with to make sure that they are feeling supported um, and able to access the benefits and information that they need for the children in their care. She also runs a virtual support group for caregivers once a month. Um, we've got information on that on our website and you can reach right out to Kari um, if you're a caregiver that's interested in that service. We are working with an evaluator um, to follow up on these services to see how um, effective they are. To date, they've been very effective. Um, this evaluator works with the caregivers and they get compensated for their participation in the evaluation. So the last thing I want to talk about briefly is our permission to contact form. This is available right on our website. Any human services agency can use it. We started out with departments of social services, working with them um, to facilitate a referral for caregivers to our services. So the whole idea is that if we give them information on the navigator and a phone number, they may or may not call us. But if we work with a human services agency in order to facilitate that referral, so the human services agency refers that caregiver to us, it takes the onus off of the caregiver and allows the navigator to reach out to that client. Um, if you fill out the form with your client and then fax it to us, we get it right to our email and we will reach out to that client within two business days to do an intake. If you write urgent, we'll do it within the same business day. And this way the client can tell us how they prefer to be contacted, 
what time they prefer to be contacted, and then we can reach right out to them and assist them. It's been very effective. We've had it for the last nine years, and the pilot counties that we worked with, we saw a 600% increase in caregivers in those counties from the year before we started the services and then the year after. So it is right available on our website, actually right on our homepage. You can click and download the link. Feel free to print it out, use it. Um, if you'd like us to send you that via mail or any other type of brochure, outreach, material, trifold, please feel free to shoot me an email and I'll get that right out to you. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Sarah Hedden from the Center for Elder Law and Justice. As I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we do see a lot with caregivers is they have barriers to legal. Um, they don't have a lot of legal options. They are confused by family court. Um, they need a little bit of assistance. So Sarah's gonna talk to us a little bit about what to expect at family court. Thanks so much, Sarah. Absolutely. <clears throat> Let me just take over the screen sharing. I think that was pretty seamless. Um, so it looks like we have about 35 participants and my presentation is really geared towards professionals and caseworkers who may be coming into contact with kinship caregivers who live in areas where there's not civil legal services available to represent them. So we're pretty lucky at Center for Elder Law and Justice. We've had funding for about 15 years to represent kinship caregivers um, and fictive kin in Erie and Niagara counties. Um, I know that the five boroughs of New York City also have programs, and I'm not sure that there's many more comprehensive programs outside of um, those areas. So I made the slides pretty in depth, so um, folks can take these with them and share them uh, with kinship caregivers. But first, I just really want to address the difference between legal advice and legal information. Um, so legal advice, <clears throat> this is definition here, specific, direct, and proposes the course of action. This is what attorneys do, and only attorneys can are, give legal advice. Legal information, factual, generic, does not recommend a course of action. So if you share information that I've provided with you today with a kinship caregiver, or you our kinship caregiver. Um, so if you're just sharing information, that's not legal advice. As I say here, um, a lot of folks will ask you, what should I do? The, as professionals, we get asked this a lot, and not just about what they should do legally, but um, the child I'm caring for has um, you know, expressed some concerns about such and such, or um, should I put the child in daycare? They're always looking for somebody to help guide them on what to do. I do give advice, but even as an attorney, I don't tell people what they should do. I tell them the likely outcomes and their choices. Um, and that's, that's more of what I do, not telling them what they should do. But just be careful that you don't cross the line from giving information to giving advice. <clears throat> so just a little disclaimer there for everybody. I uh, won't go through this, but useful information to hang on to. So docket numbers and file numbers. File numbers in family courts. Um, so there are different numbers of digits. In Niagara County family, we're at five digit numbers. Erie County family is at six digit numbers. Niagara IDV is at three digit numbers. Um, so each family um, is assigned a file number according to the father. So if I, as a woman have uh, four children and they have, you know, two have one father and two have the other, another father, they will have two separate file numbers um, per father. I imagine this will change soon with the new uh, Parentage Act that allows same-sex couples to establish parentage without having to go through an adoption. So there will be some um, non-fathers that are assigned file numbers and when a child, when paternity is not established and the only parent is a mother, that child will receive a separate file number. So if I had three children and no paternity, my kids would each have their own file number. 
And then um, on the left side of the page, you'll see all of the prefixes. Um, people, you know, they, they throw around vDocket and nDocket, and they're never quite sure, like, what does it mean or where does it come from? So it, they're all listed here. Um, some are a little confusing. So F is support, where you would think maybe S should be support, but it's not. It's F, and S is for a PINs case. Um, v for custody. Not sure why they didn't make it a C, possibly because of visitation. But here is a list of all of the docket numbers. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to go through this either. These are just acronyms. As I was preparing for this, I just kind of thought up all the acronyms that I use that when I'm talking with somebody who's new says, what did you say? What does that mean? So just a list of common acronyms that you or people that you're working with might come into contact with. Um, so these are the key takeaways, and I put them up front just in case I bore you and by 1250 you're not paying attention anymore. Um, so whether you're a caseworker assigned to the case um, or the caregiver, and especially the caregiver, go to every court appearance that you can, that you're able to go to, and especially the permanency hearings. If you're caring for the child, um, the country caregiver has an absolute right to receive a copy of the permanency hearing report. And if they've cared for a child for more than 12 months, if that child is then out, placed outside of their home, say they're moved to a, a different family member's home or foster care, as long as they're still in a non-permanent, um, they're still removed from the home and they don't have permanency yet, and there are still permanency hearings pending, then the caregiver will be entitled to attend the hearing and receive a copy of the report, even though the child's not with them anymore. Get involved right away. I see this a lot where a caregiver will come to me, um, you know, 18 months in, kids been in foster care for say a year or 18 months. Then I ask them, you know, why did you wait so long? And the common answer is I, the parent wasn't sharing information with me or they were sharing misinformation. You know, they told me that they're gonna be home soon they're coming home with the next court date and the caregiver didn't want to get involved. But the more, the more time that passes, the harder it is to get a child back with family and out of non-relative foster care because kids need stability. So especially a young child. So if you have a very young child or a newborn infant placed in non-relative foster care and a year or more passes, it's going to be really hard to convince the judge to move the child from the foster home to the relative, um, especially if the foster parent is a pre-adoptive resource. And once they've had the child for more than a year, they have standing. So if the department is seeking to move the child, they have standing to object to that and to participate in any appearances. So regardless of what the parents tell you, even if you might make them mad by talking to a caseworker or going to court, do it. If you are not the placement resource, visit as much as possible. Talk to the caseworker, um, try to get your own visits. Um, children who are in care often have visits with, you know, maybe mom and dad separately, maybe a grandparent. They might have services and counseling. So they have seen a ton of people and they're stretched in a lot of directions. So the department and caseworkers will often not want to add yet another appearance, um, I'm sorry, another visit for the child. So perhaps you could visit during a parent's visit, um, but only do that if you have approval. Don't just show up. You'll get in big trouble. If you cannot be a placement resource or if you haven't been approved for a placement resource, say you don't have enough room in your home and you're looking for a larger home, offer to be the visitation resource. Offer to um, supervise the parent and the child visiting together. Be nice to the caseworkers. If there's any caseworkers on this call, um, I hope you appreciate me saying that. Um, the caseworkers, not only do they have incredibly tough jobs, they have too many cases, they are experiencing vicarious trauma daily, um, and they might be a bit ornery. It's really tough work. Um, think of first impressions. So and we've all met people that we really took a pretty instant disliking to, sometimes based on their own actions. So you want to make a good impression. I'm not saying be disingenuous, but be nice to them. Don't point fingers. Don't lay blame. Think about your end goal and how you can get there. And you can certainly, as the saying goes, catch more flies with honey than shit. 
whatever it is. Um, always be respectful, really everywhere, all the time, just be a good person, but particularly in court, be respectful to everybody. I have seen countless times judges call folks out for making a face in court, you know, like rolling your eyes or somebody else is talking and someone's shaking their head no. The judge will call you out. And it's even easier to be noticed by the judge when you're doing something like that now because the, we have the judge and she can see everybody on one screen. So, you know, you're not in the corner of a, of a, a courtroom. You're right there and the judge will take note of your facial expressions, your head shaking, um, your uh, really any kind of disrespect. <clears throat> Have faith and patience. That's something Dave Shapiro, um, as I said, my mentor, my friend, my colleague, that's something that he has told me from day one when I started at Center for Elder Law and Justice. And he tells his clients that obviously people don't love to have their family involved in the child welfare system, but it is a almost always a lengthy process and patience is huge. And um, the safe side is faith and patience. Remember that. So how do cases start? Really one of two ways. Um, on the left-hand side, we have, you know, family members are aware there's an issue. Uh, kids have been missing school late. Maybe they appear disheveled. The parents um, aren't waking up on time. Uh, kids are calling late at night. Hey, I can't wake mom up. You know, their family notices something's happening and they either make a CPS call, you know, try to intervene with the family, or file a petition for custody. Um, alternatively, if CPS is already involved, maybe the family didn't know something was going on. Um, people are pretty good at, at hiding their, their dirty laundry. So maybe CPS got involved and contacts the kinship caregiver. Hey, can you be a resource? Um, when that happens, that often leads to a safety plan or an alternative living arrangement where the CPS caseworker consults with the parent or caregiver, the, the parent, mom or dad, and asks them, do you have somebody who can care for your child for a short period of time? They can't be safe in your home. And in that situation, it's often that CPS should be filing a neglect. And for many reasons, they don't always file a neglect. They, um, in some of those instances, are trying to have the least amount of impact on the family, keep the child, um, well, I won't get into the reasons because there can be so many, but they will develop the safety plan. You know, say it's maternal grandmother. So mom calls her mom. Hey, CPS is here. Can you take my kids for at least a few days? They kind of make an informal agreement. And it's important to know that this is not legal. Um, the CPS caseworkers are in, they present as people with authority and they do have some authority, but they don't have the authority to make um, to change custody of a child or make any legally binding instructions. So I have clients often tell me, the CPS caseworker told me I can't allow dad to take the child or I can't let mom be alone with the child. So yes, that's probably the best idea. And the caseworker is keeping the child's safety and best interest in mind by giving these instructions. However, they're not legally binding. So unless there's a court order and you're involved in a safety plan, the parent can get the child anytime they want. Um, what I tell my clients who are in a safety plan and they don't have a court order and they're concerned about safety, if the parent shows up and tries to take the child, call the police. Depends on the jurisdiction. Um, more times than not, I see police say the child appears safe here. This is where the child already was when I showed up. I'm going to leave well enough alone. I'm not making the child go with the parent, deal with it in family court. I have on a few occasions seen uh, police officers say, look, this is the parent. You have no legal authority. The kid goes with the parent. Um, so just a few things to keep in mind with those. And if you are in a safety plan, call the navigator. They can give you the best advice right away. Uh, when either you're in a safety plan or not, if you're caring for a child that you don't have legal authority to care for, do your best to get a parental designation form signed by the parent. Um, it's under general obligations law and a parent can um, give 
medical and educational decision making authority to another person for either um, up to 30 days with just a signature or up to 12 months if their signature is notarized. They can also choose a specific period of time. These are really useful for anybody. So, you know, say I go on vacation and I'm leaving my kids with my mom, I might be out of the country for seven days. I will, and I have, I'll sign one, you know, from July 1st to July 15th. My mom can make medical decisions for my kids because I trust her to do that and I want her to be able to respond to any emergencies in the moment. Do know, however, that these are not legally binding and they are revocable at any time. So just because a parent signs one for 12 months does not mean that the caregiver then has authority for 12 months. They could have it for one day if the parent then revokes it. Um, so I, as I talked about, uh, often a family member will see that something's going on, parent isn't really cooperating, and they then file a petition. So this presentation would have looked a lot different a year and a half ago. I would have said, go to court, get a copy of a petition, maybe see someone at the help desk. Now it, there's a few more options. Um, so you can still go to court and get a, a paper copy of a petition, fill it out right then and there. The court clerk can um, notarize your signature and, and they will take it from you and, and file it for you. You could also um, fill one out online. The court does have copies of those petitions online that you could print and fill out or download a Microsoft Word copy and type it in. Um, I think the easiest way for, for pro se litigants, for non-represented folks, is to use the guided interview. So the interview asks questions, the um, person filing the petition will answer those questions and the petition gets filled in print it at the end, and then they can file it. Once, it, So if you're not filing in person, once the petition is all filled out, have it notarized, and the caregiver can scan it um, into a PDF format. And smartphones, pretty much everyone has smartphones nowadays, and there are free scanning apps. So you can scan it into a PDF. Definitely don't take pictures of it. Pictures of documents never come out well, and it's not a PDF. It has to be a PDF to file on EDS. So the system is super easy to use. Um, it'll walk you right through it. And if anyone is confused or just wants to check it out ahead of time, there is um, a video and instructions on how to use the system. Once you file it, <clears throat> you'll provide your email address and you get confirmation of the filing. I get it within like 10 seconds. And within a few days, I then get some kind of a follow up message from the court telling me either that my petition was accepted and is now with that part or it was rejected for some reason. What do you include in the petition? Um, this is pretty important. Star this page. I absolutely have the parents addresses, the children's names and dates of birth, and your allegations are the most important part. You got to be specific, not your thoughts and feelings. You know, I, I think that the, the child is sad. It, it feels like, you know, mom's not taking care of them. It does, that doesn't matter. You need to have very specific allegations, incidents, dates that they happened, or even the best to your knowledge, the time frame. Um, any patterns of behavior you've seen, especially if the behavior has changed recently. Um, your, because you want to be the caregiver, your prior relationship with the child, your fitness to care for the child. So how long have you lived at your current residence? Do you have a job and how long have you been at that job? If not, what is your income? Um, the source of your income, you don't have to put your income in there, but just that you have a source of income and it's sufficient for you to care for the child, those sorts of things. If you do have anything in your past that um, would cause a judge to question your ability to care for a child, such as an indicated CPS report or some criminal history, I every time will advise people to include it in their petition. The court is almost certainly likely to find out. And if you're not upfront about it, it will look worse for you. So it's best to take those negative things and address it head on right away. So, you know, you could say I was indicated in 2005 because I had left my children home alone. I cooperated with CPS 
And since then, I've done such and such. You know, I've never left my children alone again. I learned my mistake. And, you know, so include things that you did to, to mitigate the, the issues since then. Um, you know, I, I had a substance abuse issue. Uh, but since then, I've completed inpatient. I've completed outpatient. And I continue to go to NA, you know, something like that. <clears throat> Another very important factor is your willingness to work with the parent and continue that parent-child relationship. There's only a few instances where you would not, where if it was severe physical abuse, severe sexual abuse. In those instances, I really hope and pray that there would be a neglect or an abuse petition filed. But um, unless there's a clear reason why the parent and child should not be seeing each other, you need to support that relationship um, for so many reasons that I won't get into right now, but parents have a right to see their kids and kids have a right to see their parents and kids love their parents. They have a, a right to love their parents and to not feel bad for loving their parents. A child is half of that parent and half of the other. Um, and if a caregiver is saying negative things about a parent, especially to a child, it's gonna make that child feel bad about themselves. And it's going to make the court really distrust your ability to properly care for the child. So we all have those thoughts and feelings. If you are having them, shut them down and work through it because the parent and child need to have a relationship um, in a way that's safe and healthy for the child. Along with that, your goal should be returning the child to a healthy and stable parent. Um, it could be next month. It could be when the child is 10 or never but it should be the goal. Um, when it comes to filing a petition, so you've got the petition, um, which is usually all that's filed, but if you need emergency relief, so if something, um, there's a really significant safety issue or the parent is about to leave town with the child and then you won't be able to find them and they might be unsafe, you can file it with an order to show cause, O-T-S-C. Um, so you would have your petition, the order to show cause is an extra page or two that goes with the petition. And on that, you write the relief that you're looking for. And it's important to make sure that what you're asking for for that emergency relief aligns with the allegations in the petition. So, you know, I'm not going to say, um, you know, we have a, a child who is home with their parents every day, get into school, but the child has um, expressed some suicidal ideations and the parents aren't uh, taking that seriously. And now the child's at risk of some serious self-harm. In that instance, you would be asking for, you know, maybe an, an emergency temporary order of, of residence, um, an order instructing the parents to immediately take the child to a hospital. You would not be asking for an order of no access with the parents because that just doesn't make sense. So you, you got to be reasonable and make sure that your um, your relief matches your allegations. And then what? You filed your petition. Um, so if you filed an order to show cause, one or two things will happen, in, at least in my experience in the counties I work in. Um, you will either see a judge that same day. They'll put you on the calendar. And you will go in likely just you, the judge, and court staff, like a court reporter, the judge may swear you in and take some testimony and decide then and there whether um, your testimony and allegations warrant that emergency relief or not. Um, in some counties, you won't see a judge and your papers will be reviewed by the judge or their law clerk, other staff, um, and the judge will determine whether to grant the relief or not and will contact you within a few days. If you did not file an order to show cause, which is more common, you only filed a petition. Uh, your case will be assigned to a judge or a referee that works with the judge, a court attorney referee, and you'll get a date. I'm seeing in four to eight weeks, but that's pretty impossible to predict now. Um, our courts, you know, really slowed to almost a halt last March. Um, all of my cases from March to June were taken off the calendar and then put back on the calendar. And during that March to June time period, petitions were still being filed. So they had to get those new petitions on the calendar as well. So there was quite a log jam that is clearing. And what I'm noticing is dates in about four to eight weeks, but could be sooner, could be longer. Um, and as I said, if there is a matter 
pending already, it's likely going to be added to that one unless you are looking for some emergency relief or if that matter is like really far out. Do your best to have the parents served with your papers before the appearance date. So say you file your petition, you get a date eight weeks out, you show up to court, no one else is there, get them served, come back in eight weeks. Now you're delayed four months. So as soon as you get confirmation from the court that you know your petition was filed, you have a docket number, an appearance date, and a summons, contact a process server and get the parents served. So even if they're um, even if they don't show up on that first date, but you have personal service, you may be able to have the judge issue a temporary order. Um, at the initial appearance, you know, let's say best case scenario, everybody is there. Everyone will be given the opportunity to get an attorney. The parents are entitled to an attorney in custody matters, and they will be given a referral to um, either the public defender, assigned counsel, whoever does that in their county. Kinship caregivers are not entitled to an attorney um, unless they already have an order of custody. So then they, they would also be referred to assigned counsel or the public defender. Otherwise, they would have to retain um, private counsel, represent themselves, or um, if they're in a county that has a civil legal services program, could qualify for representation. Um, and just back to my last point. So let's say you don't get them served. You have a first, you, you file today, you have a court date, let's say August 1st. Nobody shows up. Then you get them served, come back on October 1st. You get the parents served, they show up to court, they ask for an attorney. And now you've come back December 1st. There's a good five months that last and nothing moved forward. So service of process is really important. Um, either at that first uh, initial appearance or at a later appearance when they have an attorney, the parents will be asked if they agree to the petition. They often don't. I haven't had very many cases resolved that easily and quickly. Um, so the next step, usually the case will go to the judge's clerk to discuss the issues and um, talk about what the judge is likely to do in a case like this and see if the parties can work it out. Um, mediation is, an, is a possibility. Um, the respondent, the parent's attorney might file a motion to dismiss. Uh, eventually, um, a fact-finding hearing could be scheduled. They're pretty rare. I would say 95% of my custody matters don't end up with a hearing. There's usually a settlement. So what's it like going to court? Um, I didn't want to talk too much about pre-pandemic um, because I... I don't know when we'll be back in family court in person. Um, the biggest thing I remember was crowded waiting rooms and long wait times. So we were there for a very long time. Um, virtual court appearances. This is all of my practice now, sitting here on court, just like I'm talking to you guys. So you get a link through Teams. <clears throat> Download the app ahead of time, either to your smartphone or your computer. Appear by video if th there's really no reason why you cannot appear by video. Um, if you don't have a smartphone and no internet access and no computer, call the court. Every courthouse in New York State is now equipped with a kiosk. Um, most of them only have one, especially the small courts, so you have to reserve it pretty far in advance. So if you need that, call the court as soon as you get the court date and ask um, to reserve the kiosk. You would So you would go to court in person to the courthouse, but you won't be in the courtroom. You'll still be appearing um, virtually. Always keep yourself muted. Um, it's huge. Background noise and then just talking. Um, don't speak over anyone because even in person, the court reporter has to write down what everyone's saying. And if two people are talking at once, the reporter can't. It's also obnoxious and the judge hates it, especially if you're talking over the judge. Don't do that. Read the room. Um, this is for sure easier for attorneys to do. One, we have a lot of experience. We're not nervous because we've gone through this a lot. So we're more comfortable in courtrooms and we're not personally or emotionally invested. So this is, it's our job and it's easier to um, think rationally and not with emotions. It's really hard to sit in a courtroom and have a family member or somebody you know, point at you and say, this person did this awful thing. And you're like, what, I, I didn't do that. <laughs> what is he even talking about? But just because somebody is making some kind of allegation doesn't mean you have to immediately defend yourself. 
especially the judge doesn't want to hear it. I understand the, the need and the desire to want to defend yourself, but you might not have to. If you feel like you do, when there's a, a pause or raise your hand and ask the judge, would the court like me to address um, what the other party said? If the court allows you to, go ahead. Um, if the court says no, quiet and mute. Um, if the court tells you to stop talking or not to talk and you continue to talk, the judge will not hear a single thing you're saying because the judge will just be mad that you ignored their directive and it will give a horrible impression. And the next time you're in court, that is what the judge will remember about you. Um, let's see. Oh, and this is just, a, just a, a good thing to keep in the back of your mind. When people are in court, that's your best behavior. If you're wearing your best clothes, you've, you know, you're, you're on your best behavior. And if your best behavior is being nasty and disrespectful and swearing in court, what the judge and the attorneys are thinking is if that's how they are in court, how are they at home with the kids? And that will really affect um, your case going forward. As I said earlier, don't make nasty facial expressions. Don't, you know, none of that, especially to the judge, but, but to nobody. Um, check your background. So don't have a messy background. I don't know if you guys can see me. I do have a pretty messy background. Um, it's just a bit of clutter. But if you have, you know, if you're appearing from your home and you have, um, you know, piles of clothes and just it, it's real messy and cluttered behind you, the judge is going to judge you on that. That's all of these things go into the judge making a decision on what's in the best interest of the child. Um, don't attend court outside. Attend court alone, especially if you have kids with you. Do not have them in the room. It's just like being in court. Don't walk around. It makes me dizzy. Everyone hates it sit still. If there is some reason that you absolutely have to get up and walk around, turn off your video. Um, I just want to see how many slides I have left because I want to save time for questions. <clears throat> okay, I have quite a few slides. Who are these people? So I kind of list who all the players are that you might um, come into contact with. So the judge and their court attorney referee and the law clerk, those are the three that you will most likely encounter on uh, virtual court appearances. The court clerks, uh, they manage the court's calendars. Um, now that we're virtual, they would be like the people that you, that you check in with. You're not seeing them as often, or you're not having as many communications with them now. Um, support magistrates, they are like judges and they handle um, support and paternity matters. Mediators are not employed by the courts. They, there can be private mediators. Um, like Erie County has Center for Resolution and Justice. They're a nonprofit that provides mediation services. So it, it could happen at the courthouse, but it would not be a court um, or OCA staff. And this is a, a really big takeaway, the attorney for the child. They are the attorney for the child. Just like I'm an attorney for a kinship caregiver. Just like mom's attorney is attorney for mom. They have no obligation to, to talk to the caregiver or anyone else. They don't have a minimum number of times they're supposed to meet with their clients. It's not a thing. People often think it is. They don't have to see the child's home. And in my opinion, they shouldn't. If they go to the child's home and they see something, they could be a, a, a fact witness. And then they, they're no longer able to be the AFC. And the child would have to get a new AFC. You might not like them. You might not agree with their position. But it doesn't mean you can have them removed. And if you ask for them to be removed without a legitimate good reason, it's that will hurt your case. Don't ask for it. Um, and their role is to advocate for what their client wants, just like that's my role. They can substitute judgment in limited circumstances. Um, I won't get into that because we're getting low on time. So common filings that we typically see are the neglect or abuse dockets, which the department files, Departments of Social Services. V dockets are custody matters. G dockets are guardianship, which in family court would be kin gap. O dockets or family offense uh, matters. P, which is paternity or parentage, and the F, which is support. Um, so neglect and abuse, like I said, filed by DSS. It may be filed by an AFC if the court gives permission. Rarely done, I've only seen it once. Um, I give the definition of neglected and abused child here. 
a lot of people refer to things as child abuse, such as smacking a child in the face. That feels like it would be a child abuse, but that would be neglect. It's excessive corporal punishment. Abuse is a pretty high standard. Um, it has to be um, an illness. Uh, so either causing a substantial risk of death, a serious or protracted disfigurement, or protracted impairment of physical, emotional health, um, or impairment of the function of a bodily uh, of a bodily organ. Even leaving a bruise or a welt on a child is would not be abuse. Um, it has to be much more severe than that, like you know, broken bones, things like that. Um, so I, I won't get too far into this. These are just the two stages of the um, neglect and abuse petitions. Um, so the fact finding section, which is, um, did they do it? They very rarely go to a hearing. There's often um, an admission and then the parent gets to work on their services, which is the dispositional phase. That can also be a hearing, but it's usually agreed upon. It's their menu or disposition. Um, usually, and I have what it usually includes, parenting, mental health, substance abuse, those kinds of things. Um, permanency. <clears throat> the permanency hearing is held 60 days, six months after 60 days from the filing. So easier way to say it, eight months. And then every six months after that, um, the child always has a permanency planning goal, which is usually starts as return to parent and then can change. Um, I mentioned ICWA here. Sorry, I'm having to move a bit fast. Um, so these are all of the uh, possible outcomes. Um, ideally, return to parent, whether it's the parent they were removed from or the other parents, like a non-respondent parent. They can be released to a non-respondent parent. Um, the non-respondent parent could receive custody of the child. Custody to a fit and willing relative or fictive kin. That's the outcome that I most commonly see and represent folks on. Uh, the kinship caregiver could take guardianship with a kin gap subsidy. Um, the parents could either surrender their rights or have their rights terminated after a hearing and the child could be adopted. Or APLA, another planned permanent living arrangement, used to be called IL or independent living. Um, custody and guardianship. Um, so custody, the caregiver has to prove, because they're not a parent, that extraordinary circumstances exist. It's a very high burden. And I give little examples here. So donuts for breakfast and McDonald's for dinner every day, kids sleeping on a bare mattress. I mean, I wouldn't raise my kids like that. And I assume most people would not. But that's not extraordinary circumstances. That's minimal parenting. They're feeding their child and they have a safe place to sleep. Um, extraordinary circumstances are abandonment, persistent neglect, untreated mental health or substance abuse issues that place the child at risk. The child repeatedly being exposed to domestic violence. Those higher things. Um, little, a couple notes on kin gap guardianship here. Um, so family court um, does kin gap guardianship after a child's been removed from home and in foster care with a kinship caregiver. A kinship caregiver would file for guardianship in surrogate's court if there are no parents available. So if the parents are deceased or mom is deceased and paternity was never established. Um, I often get asked, what's the difference between custody and guardianship? Almost nothing. The a, a custodian or a guardian have really equal authority to care for a child. The bigger difference between the two proceedings are that um, it's a bit of a tougher burden in surrogates court because the court requires an SCR check. So they run a background check to see if there's any um, CPS indicated CPS reports. So a bit of a uh, more hoops to jump through. Family offenses, um, I handle these on maybe 10% of my cases where um, a often a parent will act in some threatening manner or uh, physically abuse the caregiver. And I just, you know, have the um, standards here for your future reference because I don't have time to go through it. Uh, paternity and parentage. So quickly, there are three ways to establish paternity in New York. So marital presumption, when a woman gives birth to a baby, if she's married, that husband is automatically the father. It's a rebuttable presumption, meaning that it can be challenged and a different man could be named as the father. But, you know, if her husband holds himself out as dad for five years and some guy comes around, he's like, look, I 
I'm pretty sure it's my kid, and he tries to make that claim, he likely would not be able to continue that claim because that child has known this person as their father for five years. Um, getting a little too far for this conversation. Um, the second way would be an affidavit of paternity. So um, an unwed mother gives birth at a hospital. This is usually how it happens. And the mother and the father sign an affidavit that he is the father that's filed with New York State Department of Health and he's officially the father. Um, they can sometimes be signed, they can be signed at any point. Uh, I had a matter where the mom had a child, paternity was not established. She got married, had two more kids, and her husband, even though he didn't even know her until that child was like five or six, he signed an affidavit of paternity. Obviously, he could not have been the bio, biological father, but completely legal to do and quicker and easier than an adoption. Um, or adjudication of paternity. So that's where a court orders um, who the father is. I would love to get into parentage, but that is just outside the scope of today. And who can get a birth certificate or an affidavit of paternity? Only that person or their parent. If you need to get one in your caregiver, ask the court for a spit an order, giving you the specific authority to get that birth certificate. And then you can get it from the Department of Health or City Hall where the child was born. Uh, child support. Most of my clients file for the non-parent caregiver grant through TANF, which does not count the child's income. Depending on the area, it starts around $350 to $400 per month. Unfortunately, that's not per child. So the more children you add, the less the, the, the caregiver gets for each child. Where if I had, th let's say I have three foster children with me and I'm getting $450 a month for regular rate, I get $450 for each kid. So $1,350 per month. If I have three kids not in foster care in my area, I would get about $700. So significant difference, particularly if the child has um, special needs and might qualify for therapeutic rate. And just to note, when the caregiver applies for TANF, they, and this is a legal term, they assign their right to receive child support from the parent to DSS. So DSS now has the right to receive support. DSS um, will usually file for support against the parent. There will be a court matter. The caregiver will receive notices. They'll see their name on the caption, but they're listed as the signer. They're not technically a party and do not have to go to court. Ah, and I did it with nine minutes to spare. So I believe that Ray was moderating the chat or the Q&A. So any questions, I would be happy to answer. And I just got to note that I do have a hard stop right at one o'clock. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, I'm going to keep your screen on. There's no sense sending it back to me. Um, I think your presentation was either so thorough or so involved that people are thinking of their questions or don't have any questions to date, um, which is totally fine. If anybody has questions, they can drop them in the chat right now. Um, you can go ahead and move it right there. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Or you've got my contact information. You've got Sarah's contact information. Um, I'm sure there's going to be questions coming up later. Um, and feel free to send us an email with any questions or any thoughts for a future conversation. Um, I see Deb Fox weighing in. Love the presentation and would love a longer presentation. Yes, absolutely. So if anything off of this presentation generated more questions for you or you'd like to hear more about it, this Lunch and Learn series is really meant for all of us professionals and caregivers to be brought together to learn more things in a half an hour or hour lunchable moment, if you will. So if there's any suggestions for future presentations or anything off of this one that you'd like to hear more about, feel free to send me an email. We will absolutely send out the recording of the presentation and the PowerPoint after this presentation. Um, expect it from us either tomorrow or on Monday. Uh, I had Sarah put a lot of information purposefully in her slides so that everybody could access it afterwards. So feel free, any follow-up questions, any suggestions, we are here for you. Um, I'm gonna let everybody go a couple of minutes early um, so we can all take a deep breath before our one o'clock meeting. So thank you so much for joining us today. Sarah, thank you so much for the information, really helpful. One of the things we hear all the time on the helpline and from professionals is how family court can be just a lot to unpack. So good amount of information and some real boots on the ground, real life strategies. So thank you so much for your time. 
And we do, before you close, we do have, we do have question. a question. Yes, we do. Yeah. Um, so as far as paying to get the paper served, so that all depends. Um, the, and I, I'm just not sure because I haven't done it as a litigant. So I, as an attorney working for civil legal services, we qualify our clients based on income. So if my clients um, are considered poor persons um, under the law, I can certify them as um, poor persons or inform a pauperous, provide that to the local sheriff, and the sheriff will then serve the papers at no cost. Um, so that's a good question for me to look into. I, have, I haven't had to advise somebody on serving papers on their own because I represent them. And when I do have a client who has the ability to afford a private process server, then they do so. Private process, process servers can cost anywhere from like $50 to $150 or so. Um, but I am going to contact um, our local sheriffs to see how it works if it's a pro se or an unrepresented litigant who needs to um, have the sheriff serve papers, but they can't afford it. So thank you for asking that. Yeah, and it looks like we do have a comment from Broome County from Julie Morgan that it's $25 to have the Sheriff's Department serve the paper. So um, we can definitely look into that and see if that is widespread or if it's another instance in where the counties all do something a little bit differently. Great question. Thank you so much. It might be. So we used to pay the sheriffs. Um, so this, and this is, it's been a while. So the sheriffs in Migrant Erie County have price lists and it's based on mileage plus it, it, it was something like $17 plus mileage. Uh, when we had um, Laura uh, start with our office, a brilliant staff attorney, she decided to give it a go. Mm -hmm. So these informa pauperous motions that attorneys file are typically filed with the court when there's a filing fee. So if I have to file in Supreme Court to start an action, you have to pay $240 to get an index number. If somebody cannot afford that, they can sort of they can tell the court I'm a poor person. Here's my income, and I can't afford it, and the fee will be waived. If I'm representing a person who would qualify, I send the affidavit that I've certified them as a poor person, and the fees are waived. We decided to try that with our local sheriffs, and it's worked. So keep them. It's working. I don't know if they're supposed to waive the fee, but they do, and it really helps our clients. Um, you know, back when we were paying, I had a client who was. I needed ten dollars from her for something. I think to get a birth certificate, and it took her almost two months to have the extra money to send it to me. So this having the sheriffs do service of process without a cost is immensely helpful to nearly all of our clients. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Well, we have um, three minutes. <laughs> I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, I want to give everyone just a second if they've got anything else. Uh, otherwise, we will wrap up. And again, you know, the ability is there. You've got my email. You've got Sarah's email. Feel free to reach out to either one of us with questions or thoughts on other presentations that might be helpful to you or your clients. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And thanks so much, Sarah. We appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm happy to help. And Have a fantastic looking forward to more. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Take care.